Hello and welcome again to What If Natives Won, a video blog and channel about alternate history and American Indians, Native Americans, Indigenous Peoples. This is the 22nd video of 28 Planet Ones. My name is Al Carroll. I'm Associate Professor of History at Northern Virginia Community College. I've written mostly about wars, veterans, human rights, and genocide. I'm also, together with Rob Schmidt of Bluecorn Comics, editing and putting out a short story collection, What If Natives Won. This is what this video, blog, and channel are about. There's a huge lack of alternate history written about American Indians, indigenous people. Many people don't like to think about genocides in America. They likely were never taught about them. Many people don't want to be reminded, want to believe these genocides never happened, or it was an accident. I've had great success using alternate history to teach my students. Show them absolutely nothing in history was inevitable. It never had to be. The worst of histories is always a conscious choice. How things turn out is based, out, is based on how evil the evil choose to be, and how well and how strongly good people choose to stand up to them or stop them. The way things turn out in history took a very specific set of circumstances. Sometimes history turns on very small things. Change even one and you have an entirely different history, different present, different society. It may be hard to hear this, but we would live right now in a dystopian world. One of the worst of all possible outcomes for anyone who is not white. America is today 98% non-native. At least 75 million to 112 million natives were killed by not one genocide, but a series of them. The last ending only in the year 2000 in Peru, with others in America, Brazil, Canada, Guatemala, Argentina, and Mexico. On top of that is massive genocide denial. This is not taught in almost all American schools. There are racist images everywhere that are often not admitted to be racist. But all of this could change if the U.S. decides to annex all of Mexico and its people after the U.S.-Mexico War. You would have a much larger multilingual U.S. with a Latino mixed-race majority today and far more surviving native peoples. As discussed in previous videos, American colonists and an invasion included many illegal American immigrants who took over Texas, ethnically cleansing most Mexicans and natives. Texas Army and Rangers killed up to a fourth of some tribes and drove out Mexicans from five cities by murders, mass rapes, and arson. That same ethnic cleansing continued for decades after Texas became a U.S. state. Mexico never agreed to, a, to Texas' supposed independence, and Texas insurgents never had control over land they claimed, the territory shown as disputed. American invaders always wanted Texas to be a U.S. slave state, they were turned down by U.S. President Van Buren to avoid conflict over slavery. Nine years later, President Tyler agreed to make Texas a slave state. The president after him, Polk, provoked a war with Mexico to seize Texas and the rest of Mexican territory, all the way to California. The war for Mexico went very badly. Mexican white elites, criollos, had been fighting among themselves since independence. Mexico had dozens of presidents in 25 years, a number of secession movements, many coups, even a self-proclaimed emperor who only lasted a few months. The U.S. conquered Mexico with great brutality. Atrocities were common, including against women, children, Catholic priests, and nuns. When it ended, U.S. troops occupied all of northern Mexico, from Canada to Texas, down south through Nuevo León and Tamaulipas, to central Mexico and Mexico City itself. Almost the only part of Mexico unconquered was Yucatan. Yucatan was in the middle of a secession movement, Mayas fighting for independence. The U.S. took the northern half of Mexico and a tenth of all Mexican people in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It claimed to pay Mexico for its land and people, but also charged Mexico for supposed damages. Though Mexicans who had now been forced to be Americans were supposed to be protected, nearly all lost their lands. Most would not have any civil rights for another 80 to 120 years. Lynchings and other racist violence and segregation would be as harsh for them as for blacks. Natives also suffered great, great losses. Most tribal nations had already been ethnically cleansed from Texas. The Navajo would suffer the long walk, losing many people in their homeland for a time in the 1860s. Worst of all is in California. California Indian genocide during the gold rush will kill at least 120,000, over 80%, by massacres by miners' militias. Most of the rest were enslaved and rapes were common. 
this genocide was finally ended by Lincoln 15 years later. How much of this could have been stopped much sooner? When the U.S. took half of Mexico and a tenth of, tenth of its people, some in Congress wanted to go even farther. The All Mexico Movement proposed taking all of Mexico and its people and making it and them part of the U.S. For a few weeks it looked like their proposal might pass. Then racists pointed out Mexico has few whites, less than a tenth of its people. Congress instead decided to take only the northern half of Mexico with far, far fewer Mexicans. What if Congress had acted more quickly? The U.S. now stretches from Chiapas and Oaxaca in the south, then northwest to Oregon Territory, over to Maine in the east, and down to Florida. Perhaps the U.S. may, may decide to conquer Mayas in the Yucatan and is in for as long a war as Mexico fought versus them. Or it may leave them alone and they become independent. Mexico's population was 13.5 million at independence, but we are far less certain about in 1848. The U.S. population in 1840 was 17 million. What that means is that Mexico has perhaps three-fourths three the size of the U.S. population at the time, or nearly 40% of the two nations combined. Over time, you'd see a Latino majority in the U.S. Due to Catholic beliefs on birth control, Mexicans eventually outnumber Anglos. The culture transforms. Catholics had different beliefs on poverty and community compared to individualism. They also segregate far less. Language, food, and other customs change. As common as Latinos' foods are today, they become that way much faster in the 1850s. Spanglish also becomes common 150 years earlier, used by non-Latinos too. The first change, though, is the Civil War begins much sooner. There are up to 35 potential Mexican states that can become U.S. states, and there is no practical way, way to divide them into less than five. Every state in the southern half of Mexico has enough people to be a state, and none of them want slavery. Texas is the only new state that could be a slave state because of so many recent white American invaders with slaves, but nowhere else in Mexico since most Mexicans are strongly anti-slavery, and many of them are black or black ancestry. One of the first things Mexico did after independence was abolish slavery. Texas even had to outlaw contact between blacks and Mexicans since Mexicans often help slaves escape with the Underground Railroad. In the short term, U.S. authorities will not allow most Mexicans to vote, since almost all are not white. But they have to give it to some people to avoid uprisings. The vote is likely limited in the beginning to, all, to those of all Spanish ancestry. Mixed ancestry people might be given the vote in some places if corrupt party bosses can use it. The same violence and land loss that happened in our own time to Mexicans in the Southwest will happen all over Mexico, but the numbers are with Mexicans, and Anglos would be the minority. What will change this and prevent it happening for long is the Civil War, which will happen 48 years earlier. How are U.S. elections affected? The two main Mexican parties play a part, liberals and conservatives, which don't mean what the terms mean in U.S. politics today. Mexican conservatives favored nobility and an official state church, but that included protecting native communities. Liberals believed in enlightenment ideas about reform, including ending the power of the church and assimilating natives. Mexico's conservatives would ally with or join American Democrats, the self-proclaimed white man's party. Liberals would side with or ally with Whigs and later on Republicans. If Pierce wins election as a Democrat, this aids secessionists and the Civil War begins in 1856 when Fremont defeats Buchanan. If Winfield Scott manages to win in 1852 with the help of Mexican voters, secessionists begin the war immediately. Southern secession and slavery is crushed much faster with huge manpower from Mexicans in the Union Army. One could expect Texas to be liberated from the Confederacy by an invasion from North Mexico going all the way to Mississippi. Very different from the Civil War in our own time. After secession's faster, faster defeat, reparations like the 40 Acres program are almost certain. It was common to reward veterans with land in Latin America. There are several hundred thousand each of black and Mexican veterans who will receive land for their time in the Union Army. So would over a million white Union veterans. These reparations to veterans would have as huge an impact as the GI Bill of the 1940s. Reconstruction in America after the Civil War of the 1850s would not just be 
in the U.S. South. It would be in all of former Mexico, not just what is now the Southwest U.S., but Mexico all the way to its south in Chiapas. This means breaking up large estates of Mexico's criollos along with southern plantations. Large Mexican landowners are the only likely ones to have sided with Confederates. You'd also see perhaps 100,000 Mexican veterans of the Civil War accepting land in the South. All these black Mexican and white Union veterans fight terrorist groups like the KKK, White League, and Red Shirts. Land keeps these veterans there, and that, plus their own passionate hatred of slavery, is why they win. How else is American history changed by a Mexican majority U.S. population? As America becomes industrial, there's no need for immigration from Eastern or Southern Europe when you have Mexican workers. No Little Italy in New York or elsewhere in the U.S. Instead, lots of Little Mexicos, barrios up to 120 years early. Mexicans later joined the Populist Party and movement in large numbers alongside white and black, and black farmers in the South and West. Many joined socialist parties, but not progressive movements. They tended to be racially exclusionary, not trust non-whites, and try to keep them out of politics. The U.S. is definitely affected by major figures in Mexican history who are now Americans. Benito Juarez is likely a pro-union congressman, a Republican. Porfirio Diaz likely becomes a union general. Later, Ricardo Flores Magón and Emilio Zapata will be revolutionary figures pushing for radical change, but not necessarily by leading uprisings. Lázaro Cárdenas would certainly be a New Deal politician, perhaps the first Latino U.S. president. Some things are harder to predict. The U.S. seems more likely to go to war against Hitler sooner, less likely to start a Cold War with the Soviets. One thing seems likely is that U.S. interventions become instead conquest of this bilingual, bicultural Estados Unidos. The Spanish-American War likely leads to both Cuba and Puerto Rico shortly becoming U.S. states. The dozens of U.S. invasions and coups seem certain to often be U.S. takeovers. All of Central America, except Belize, becomes U.S. states. The Panama Canal will always be in a U.S. state. Haiti and Dominican Republic may be U.S. states too. Even Colombia or Venezuela might be forcibly brought into the U.S. The rest of South America is very unlikely as impractical, but instead of 50 U.S. states, there might be as many as 100. Instead of today's 330 million Americans, Los Estados Unidos might be as many as 600 million Americanos. Those 600 million would not be just majority Latino. They would include tens of millions more blacks, since there are many in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, and elsewhere. That would also include tens of millions of mixed ancestry mestizos in a U.S. where segregation is defeated in Reconstruction. And it will include over 100 million natives from Mexico and Central America, tens of millions more than in our own time. Mexico dealt with its natives by forced assimilation. The U.S. legally defined mixed ancestry as native and set up reservations. That means the same proportions shown in this chart at independence would still be true today. Many shown as mestizo would be legally defined as native. So Mexico would still be majority native rather than majority mestizo. So would Central America. Los Estados Unidos with over 100 million natives making up a sixth of the U.S. population instead of 7 million at 2% in a mixed ancestry, mixed culture, Latino majority society where non-whites have civil and voting rights much sooner. All of that is certainly native victory. This is the end of the 22nd video. I look forward to your comments and questions and will answer them as often as I can. Racism, genocide denial, childish behavior, personal attacks get deleted. I do recognize some questions will be asked in ignorance because much of the facts I point to are new to most people. They were never taught about this. They've been raised in denial since denying indigenous genocides is taught in almost all public schools. Next time we will discuss what if independent native nations break from Mexico and Nicaragua. Please repost freely, like, share, and comment. I'll post again in about a week. This has been What If Natives One video blog and channel.